have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. I've got a word for this body this evening. I believe God's put on my heart to share with you. I, uh, you know me, I'm normally one of those, I like to preach the fire, walk out of here smoking and flaming, amen. This is not going to be a, a, a shout and run down the aisles kind of message, but it is necessary and it is relevant. God has a, a, a message for us here. Hallelujah. If we always lived on a shout, we'd never have to walk in the valley. If we always lived on the shout, we'd never know what it was like to walk in the valley of the shadow of death and yet fear no evil. If we was never sick, we'd need, we wouldn't need a healer. If we always had everything we need, we wouldn't need a provider. You can't always live on the shout. Sometimes you have to walk in the valley. Paul said it was in my weakness that his strength was made perfect. And yet in, in many churches and organizations today, I see uh, Christians well-intended, and they want to keep their, their shortcomings, they want to keep their sickness, they want to keep their weakness, they want to uh, keep their, their financial need a secret, as if it's something to be ashamed of. They want to... Uh, uh, put, a, put on a face and, and put on a mask and come into church and, and praise God, everything is, is great. I'm blessed and highly favored of God. But my electric's been shut off for three weeks. <laughs> there is uh, power in a testimony. It's not always... Uh, it's not always beneficial to hide what you're going through because your situation could be somebody else's answer. Exodus chapter 5. I'm going to begin at verse 20, conclu conclude with verse 22. It'll get better, I promise. <laughs> when they left Pharaoh's presence... They met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. For you have made us odious in the, in the Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants. Uh, that word means uh, he hates us. And you made us hate, him wor hate us worse. You made us hideous in his sight. You, you've made us uh, uh, something to be loathed. You've made us loathsome in his sight. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Have you ever been in the place where you ask God, God, why did, why did you put me here? Why did you send me to this place? Why did you put me in that situation knowing that I was going to react the way that I did, knowing that I was going to say what I said, and you the one that told me to say it, and when I said it, it turned around bad for everybody. God, why did you put me here? The title of my message this evening is The Challenge of Transition. The challenge of transition. Before we get to our text, I, I've got to give you some context so you can understand the weight of the situation. In Egypt at the time is a body of people called Israel. Israel is the chosen nation of God. Uh, 
birthed from the loins of Jacob who had his name changed into Israel who was the son of Isaac who was the son of Abraham. Abraham was the uh, father of, of faith is his nickname. He, he was the one God made promises with him and told him you'll dwell uh, forever in the land of Canaan. Well, I'll give you this land and to your descendants I'll make you a father of many nations. I've set this covenant before you and uh, so they, they have this huge covenant. It's one of the first major covenants since Adam. And, and, and here is Abraham and Abraham's children's children's children. And they're in the land of Egypt. But in order to understand, we've got to go back to Jacob, the son of, his, uh, the, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Jacob, before they moved into Egypt, they lived in the land of Canaan. Now, this was the land that was promised to Abraham. This was, this was where the children of Israel, this is where the, the family of Jacob lived before they moved into Egypt. They lived in Canaan. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 17. It says it here. It's a promise to Abraham. Now, they're living in the land of Canaan, and this is the land that God has promised to Abraham. Look at this. It says, I will establish my covenant between me and you. This is God talking to Abraham. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So there's two parts. I'm going to give them this land and I'm going to be their God. That's the two parts of the promise that he gave to Abraham. And so it's important to know that this is the, the place where God has promised to Abraham. Because that's when Exodus comes in. We'll get there here in a minute. Uh, but they're already living here. The family of Jacob. So in future chapters, we'll see that they're fighting the Canaanites, right? They were taken out of the land of Canaan and put into Egypt, and then they will be taken out of Egypt and put back into Canaan, and they'll have to battle those that have taken over the land of Canaan in order to, be, to get back into what they call the promised land. The reason they call it the promised land is because of this promise right here. But it's often overlooked that the family of Jacob was already living in this land before they went to Egypt. They were already there. They were already living in the land that was promised. They were already in the place that flowed with milk and honey. They were already there before they ever went to Egypt. Have you ever been in the place and you knew that God told you this is where you were going to be? And then God turns around and says, but I need you to go over here. You know that you know that you know that you're in the place that God has promised for you. And yet he wants to move you from the promise. You thought, you thought surely that when you finally got to the place that God had promised that it would all be milk and honey. And, and that it was going to come a certain way and that it was going to look a certain way. And then when you get there, he's telling you, well, you still got to go through a transition before this can be the place. There's some experience you got to have first. There's some life lessons you got to have first. Trust me. <laughs> You'll be in the place and you'll be like, haven't I learned this already? What, what else can I possibly get from this situation? I've been in that place. I, God, I've been here for five years. What else is there that I can get from this situation before you pull me out of here? What else do you need from me? But then I look back. I say, God, if you'd have take me out, taken me out a minute earlier, I'd have missed this. And I'd have had to learn it down here. And I wouldn't have been able to get to the next spot because I hadn't learned it in the first place. And so I had to take an extra step to get there.
You look back and you see the hand of God just guiding you from place to place to place to place in time and where you're supposed to be, just like he did with Jacob's son, Joseph. They're already living in the promised land, but they're not living in the promised time. They were in the right place at the wrong time. And so God begins to transition them because there was a work that he had to do with his people before they could become the nation that he had promised Abraham that they would become. So he starts to transition them, and he starts with Joseph. Now, the Bible tells us that Joseph's brothers hated him. And for a long time, I was always uh, assumed that they hated him because of his dreams. You know, Joseph was a dreamer. And, uh, and he had this one dream that... Uh, his his uh, wheat stalk was standing there, and the, and the other stalks bowed down to it, you know. And then he told his brothers, he said, well, that, that dream means that one day you'll bow down to me. Well, him being one of the young, youngest sons uh, didn't go over well. I, uh, I have a younger sister, and if she'd have said that to me, it wouldn't have went over well. <laughs> So I always thought that that was the reason that they hated him, but the Bible tells us that they hated him before that time. Because when he was 17 years old, he's out in the, in the field tending the flock with his brothers, and then all of a sudden he turns around and comes home, and when he gets home, the father says, well, how, how is everything going out there? And the Bible says that he brought a, bra a, brought a bad report on them. So they're not mad that he's a dreamer. He, they're mad because he's telling on them. Here comes the favorite son, the Bible says, and he's telling on them, ratting them out. So they hated him already. And then he comes over telling them that, that one day they're going to bow down to him. And the Bible says that they hated him even more. So he's already hated, and now he's having these dreams, and it's causing him to be hated even more. Eventually, they grab hold of him and put him in a pit and uh, tell his father that, that he died and then sell him off into slavery. And the, the, uh, the uh, Ishmaelites take him and, and sell him to uh, this man named Potiphar. Potiphar is the uh, officer of Pharaoh, the, the head of the bodyguard. And so now he's went from being the favorite son in the promised land to the slave of a man that doesn't believe in the God that he serves under a king that he doesn't belong to. Can you imagine being in that place and having these prophetic dreams and visions and God's visiting you in the middle of the night and you're in the place that, that had been promised to your grandfather and, and here you are. All of a sudden found yourself in slavery. But the Bible says that uh, Joseph found favor in the sight of Potiphar and became his personal servant, and Potiphar put him over his whole household. So now he's, he's growing up under Potiphar and, and has charge of all his, his uh, personal effects. But we're still outside the promised land. I can imagine Joseph thinking the whole time, I've got to get back to the promised land. Got to get back to the place that God intended for me to be. I was the favorite son. I was supposed to be the one that wore the coat of many colors. And, and I was, I can imagine. You know, we like to tell this story and then take it from the, the part where they sell Joseph into slavery all the way up until he's the right-hand man of Pharaoh. But there, is, there are years that Joseph is in slavery and then Potiphar's wife tries to uh, seduce him, and, and uh, he turned her down, so she screams, and he ends up in jail. So now he's not only a slave, but he's an imprisoned slave. In a land that he doesn't know, surrounded by people speaking a language that he didn't speak, who serve gods that he has no idea about.
it would be one thing if we could blame this on someone. You know, if, if we could take this situation and he's in the midst of all of his trouble and his, his trials, and we could say that, well, if, 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 if they hadn't sold him into slavery, maybe, maybe Israel could have stayed in the promised land. And they wouldn't have had to go to Egypt. And, 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 and then maybe they could have uh, not had to battle the Canaanites. And then there wouldn't be an exodus. And if we could just blame them. But it wasn't just them. The Bible says God was positioning Joseph. Because there was a famine coming. There was a famine coming a few years down the road and that, uh, the, the children of, of Israel were going to need food. And so God, taking the situation, worked it for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Have you ever been in the place knowing that there's a promised land. Dying to get back to it. And you feel like this isn't the place of promise. This, this can't be it. Working a job I don't care about. Taking care of situations that don't even concern me. Cleaning up other people's messes. I know God has promised bigger things. Higher dreams. Greater increase. And yet. Here I am in a place that I don't even recognize. How did I get here? It's easy to get into this place and then think, God, what did I do wrong? Where, where did I get off track? How did I get outside of your will? Just because it doesn't look like the promise doesn't mean you're outside of his will. You may be beating yourself up and blaming yourself and running yourself down into the ground trying to figure out where you misstep, but you might just be in the middle of a transition. Transition always comes with challenge. God's hand stays on Joseph and guides him until he was appointed, appointed to be the second in command under Pharaoh in Egypt. He goes through everything that we had talked about. Potiphar's wife, jail time, talks to the, the baker, talks to the cupbearer. Both of those guys, one of them dies. The other one forgets him. Only two friends he's got in jail. Then Pharaoh has a dream. Remember, Joseph is the dreamer. Had a dream and interpreted the dream for his brothers. Two different things that happen in the same instance. Has the dream, interprets the dream. So when, when Pharaoh has a dream and, and he's already interpreted the dream of the, of the uh, cupbearer. And uh, here's the cupbearer beside the king. And the, and the Pharaoh's having this dream and nobody can interpret it. And so the cupbearer remembers this one kid that was in jail for rape. He says, well, I might know somebody. The Bible says your gift will make room for you. Notice, it was never Joseph's hard work. It wasn't his intelligence. It wasn't his uh, uh, looks. His looks is what got him in jail in the first place. If he'd have been ugly, maybe Potiphar's wife would have left him alone. Wasn't none of that that put him on the right hand of Pharaoh. It was his gift. His, his gift made room for him. So God puts Joseph in charge of all the food of the land. There comes this famine, and now you've got Joseph is there in charge of the only storehouse that's around. And Joseph's family, who thinks he's dead, are starving. But they hear that there is food in Egypt. And so Israel sends his sons to go to Egypt and to get the food. Now 
through a long series of events, Joseph ends up revealing his identity to his brothers and, and they call in his father. And, and God, knowing all, saved Israel, the, the, the family of Israel, from extermination. And he did it through their mistakes and he did it through their missteps. And he did it in order to keep the promise that he had made with Abraham. Remember, this is about the covenant that he made with Abraham. They'll become a great nation. I'll be their God. Right? And so at the end of this story of Joseph, we find that Joseph takes and, and moves the whole family of Israel out of the land of Canaan into the land of Goshen. Which has now become the land of prosperity. So they're no longer in the promised land, but they're in a good land. Here they are, they're they're safe, they're fed, they're protected. All looks good. It's a blessing from God. God arranged it so that they could multiply and have room to grow and they would have uh, supplies for all of their lifetime. But then we find in Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says Joseph died and his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel, remember this started as one family and they're growing. The sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land, watch this, was filled with them. The land was filled. God had blessed them so much that they filled up the whole place that God had given them to live. They maxed it out. I mean, maxed it out to the point where they started uh, uh, pushing in on the Egyptians. And the, and the Egyptians will later have a problem with this because they're getting so huge. It was huge when they were a family. But now that they've grown, the space where they, what, that they were given has become too small. What was once a blessing became a burden. The Hebrews, the Israelites, they outgrew their blessing. And I have to tell you, if you keep growing and you keep maturing, you will outgrow your blessing. The thing that God used to bless you yesterday will not work for you tomorrow. You're going to outgrow it. I know this job saved my life last year, but this year I need a bigger blessing. I I know we've been growing slowly, but we need a bigger blessing. I know it's been done this way for 25 years, but I need a bigger blessing. Transition. Transition me, God. Just because God did something yesterday does not mean it is your answer today. Egypt began as a blessing. It began as a blessing. But then what was initially the blessing became the thing that was pressing. You know you're growing when what once would bless you begins to press you. When you put a grape in a press... You get grape juice. But when you put an olive in a press, you get olive oil. When you begin to grow and the circumstances start pressing, what comes out of you? That was just a side note. The expression, we've always done it this way, is the death of many churches across the nation. What you've always done, 
will only ever lead you to where you've already been. If you want something new, you have to do something different. Say, transition me, God. Don't be scared of it. I got you scared of transition now, huh? (laughs) Here's what happens. There's always challenge in transition. So Joseph goes through all of this, the slavery, the false accusations, and prison time to get to where God needed him. And now, after all of that, the blessing that God had set up to begin with is becoming the burden that they have to escape. Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So now they're not only outgrowing the place that God's put them, but they're being pressed by a leader who's dealing harshly with them. Sometimes the uncomfortable situations that you're put in is just God trying to transition you. Keisha and I have been uh, involved in a couple of different churches before we came back home to this one. And uh, there is a distinct um, feeling when God starts to transition you. There is a distinct, uncomfortable, miserable stirring that stirs on the inside of you until you can't let it go, until you can't sleep at night, till you can't give it up, till you got to have something new, till you got to have something different, till you're not satisfied with where you've always been, till you're not satisfied with where you are. It's a transition. children of Israel they were in transition they began to pray and the Lord said I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters for I am aware of their sufferings what's he saying I know I know they're miserable I know that they've got a stirring in them. I know that they're not satisfied with where they're at because I'm the one that put it there for them to be miserable in the first place. I'm the one who put it in their hearts that said they need to be transitioned because if I hadn't put it in them to to, to want to transition in the time that I had them to transition, they would stay in Egypt and they would die in Egypt. And my covenant people would never come to fulfillment. I put it there. God hears their prayers and begins to move on their behalf. He calls Moses in Exodus 3 in the the form of a burning bush. And he talks to him and, and turns his rod into a serpent and has him pick it back up again. And then he tells Moses to go out before Pharaoh. And him and Aaron go out before Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 5. And they approach Pharaoh. And here is where we find our text. They've talked to Pharaoh, and, and Moses comes in empowered by the Holy Ghost, and he, he's, he knows that he's got powers that, uh, that God has given him, and, and here he comes. I can imagine standing 10 feet tall before the presence of Pharaoh. He throws his rod down, and it turns to a serpent. But then I can imagine the sinking feeling in his stomach when the three Egyptian magicians did the same. Didn't look like what he thought it was going to look like. Because I can imagine what Moses was thinking on the way to Pharaoh. I can imagine that he thought that it was going to go smooth because he was going to do what God had told him to do. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh was going to see, well, well, you've got power and your God has power. We'll just let him go. But it didn't happen that way. Because the Bible says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So we're starting to see a picture that from the very beginning, from the time that they put Joseph into slavery, this has all been a big transition. And God has had his hand in all of it. Could have been smoother if Pharaoh would have just let him go in the first place.
But no, Pharaoh gets angry and he increases the workload on Israel. Says, well, if you've got time to, to talk about this and conspire against me, then you don't need to, we don't need to provide you with straw. You can go get your own straw and you still got to make the same number of bricks. So now it's worse than when, when Moses had got there. And we find our text when Pharaoh... When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron. Now, this is the, task, the, uh, the people who are over um, Israel. They've been beaten because they didn't meet their quotas. And, and so these are Israel's leaders. And here they come and they say, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. For you have made us odious in, in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses returned to the Lord. Lord, why did you bring me here just to harm these people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, all he's done is harm this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Have you ever wanted to pray something and then thought, if I pray that, will God strike me down? Have you ever been so mad at God that you just wanted to shake him if he wouldn't sh shake you back? <laughs> Come on, have you ever been in that place so mad and so angry at the situation How about this one? You ever been so mad at God that you don't even want to talk to him? God, why did you even put me here to begin with? Hmm. This doesn't look anything like what it was supposed to look like. It doesn't even look like we're making any progress here. You said you were going to deliver these people and you were going to use me to do it and, and you told me what to say and what to do and I did it and it turned out worse than when we started. Many times, the challenge in the transition is that it doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. If you could predict the way that the transition would go, it would make it much easier. But then it wouldn't take faith. But in order to get to the promise, we have to face the challenge. Because no matter what the transition looks like, there's a promise on the other end. All of this was going on so that the promise that was made to Abraham could be fulfilled in the nation that is his children. It's all about the promise. God's good on his word. He's not a man that he should lie, and neither is he the son of man that he should have to repent. If he said it, he will do it. So we're in the midst of, of Egypt, and everything that Moses has done has made it worse. And God said, stand back. See that I don't fulfill my promise. He starts sending plague after plague one after the other, on the Egyptians. He turns the water into blood. He sends frogs and he sends insects over the land. The cattle start dying off. Boils start coming up on the Egyptians. Hail starts falling from the sky. He sends a cloud of locusts that eats the entire crop. He sends darkness that's palpable. And still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And so God sends the last plague. We call it the Passover, where Israel had to put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts and the firstborn of all Egypt, those who weren't marked with the blood of the lamb, were taken. 
Pharaoh finally releases the children of Israel and then goes after them to kill them. So we go through all of this time where God is showing his mighty power and finally Pharaoh turns them loose. But they don't, they get no more than out of sight. And here goes Pharaoh talking to his commander. What have we done? We've let them go. We need to go get them. So they mount up on their chariots and they're chasing them. Take off. And the Bible says in Exodus 14, As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is it because there was no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. God had set them free, but they were resisting the transition of freedom. They were in the midst of the challenge of transition. They cry out for deliverance, but resist the transition. Transition is never comfortable. If you read through through the book of Exodus all the way into the book of Numbers, every time, every time there's the slightest bit of trouble, Israel turns around and says, we should have just stayed in Egypt. We should just stayed outside the promise. We didn't need this promise that bad anyway. Who cares about what God had promised Abraham? I'm really not that concerned about it. Let's go back to being slaves. Every time. In fact, the first time they were only three days out. <laughs> they had only been out of Egypt for three days and start grumbling against Moses. I don't know why he brought us out here anyway. Can't find no water anywhere. It wasn't easy for them, even after they were turned loose out of Egypt. They resisted the transition at every hard spot. They looked back at Egypt and wanted to go back, but Moses was always there. He's always saying, nope, God sent us here. This is where we're going to go. In fact, there was one time that God turned around and he got so frustrated with them. He said, Moses, why don't you stand back? I'll wipe them off the face of the planet and then I'll start over with you. And Moses said, now God, if you did that, all of the world knows that you've delivered them. And then they'll turn around and say, well, you just brought them out so that you could kill them yourself. But for the sake of your own name, Have mercy on them. Transition is sometimes the most difficult in church. You like coming and you sit on the same seat every Sunday and and, uh, you like the same kind of experience and and the same ambiance and the same lighting and the same style of music. And if one thing changes... Who told them they could do that? Why Why do we need that anyway? We've been doing this for 25 years, and here we are. They're coming in here trying to change stuff. Why do they need to change it? I was happy for all this time being stagnant, and I don't need none of that. Part of the difficulty is when we're being transitioned, it's easy to focus on where you've been rather than where you're going. But I challenge you, don't let the memory of what it used to be invade the thought of what the promise says it will be. I'll say it again. Don't let the memory of what it used to be invade the thought of what the promise said it will be.
There's somebody in this room, you think you're under the, an attack of the enemy, but God said you're just in transition. He said what the enemy meant for your harm, he's going to use as a tool for your change. The very thing that the enemy thought to hold you down will be the launching pad that God uses to send you to the promised land. Transition isn't easy, but it's worth it. God transitioned Israel time and time again, both physically and spiritually, until finally the Savior came forth from the tribe called Judah. All of this time, he's been transitioning and protecting and moving from one place to the other, and they finally got back to the promised land and, and got established, and then the exiles came. And, but all this time, that every transition, God was pointing it in a certain direction so that one day Jesus could come forth out of the midst of the tribe of Israel. God always has the end goal in mind for you. Don't get so bogged down in the transition that you become like Israel and wish again for the bondage of Egypt. Don't get so focused on yesterday that you can't look at tomorrow. I've heard it this way. I've, I've heard churches say it like this. They, they say, well, I wish we could go back to the good old days. There wasn't nothing wrong when, when we was singing out of them hymn books and clapping our hands and stomping our feet and God wouldn't move. You know, the reason God doesn't move nowadays because we got all these lights and the smoke and the music and all. If we could just go back, if we could just go back to Egypt, <clears throat> well, we don't, we don't need that class anyway. We get everything we need from Sunday morning. Why would I come to Sunday school in the first place? I got to get up an hour earlier to come into Sunday school to learn the Bible. I can read the Bible at home. I'll just stay right here in Egypt, thank you. Y'all don't point. That's not nice. <laughs> stay with me. I'm through. There's always a promise. Stand with me. <laughs> what, what <are> you? <laughs> it's about that time, Ricky. It's about that time. I'm going to have somebody throwing me in Egypt if I don't quit here soon. <laughs> there is always a promise at the end of the transition. Don't let the transition wear you out. Yes, it's tough. Yes, it's a challenge. Yes, it'll make you question everything. It'll make you question your sanity, and it'll make you question your faith, and you'll wonder whether you made the right choice to get here. You'll wonder whether you're in the right place or if it's the wrong time or the right time. You will wonder if God really told you that. You will wonder if you read the Scripture right. You will wonder, and you will think, and the devil will try to come in and distract you and keep you off. But there is a promise at the end of this transition. There's a promise. Turn to somebody and say, there's a promise. There's a promise. Don't lose sight of the promise. There was pain in the transition of Jesus. He had to go through it. He stepped down from eternity and wrapped himself in humanity and had to go through a transition. But when it was over, he stood resurrected by the power and the glory of God, wrapped in glory and all power, because there was a promise at the end. There's a promise. Father, I pray that you keep us in this hour. 
Lord, strengthen us. Help us to get through the transition. Help us to remember the promise, oh God. Remind us of the promise when we get bogged down in the transition. Father, I pray that you keep us and you strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen.